90% of consumers read online reviews before visiting a business. What do people see when they look you up online? We give you the tools you need to take control of your reputation. Send surveys to your customers via text message with Testimonial Collector. Get five-star reviews on all the major platforms like Google, Yelp, and more. Track what people are saying about your business with Reputation Manager. Respond to comments and turn negative reviews into happy customers. See what your competitors' customers are saying about them with Competition Tracker. Learn great marketing tactics and what it takes to stay on top. A bigger social presence means more connections. Automatically generate and schedule engaging social media posts with Social 365. Build trust, boost sales, and grow your business. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another day in the life of an entrepreneur on a Thursday. So I always want to thank, I'm so gracious and so happy to have so many great dedicated um, listeners and subscribers. So for those of you who have been downloading my shows, how I appreciate you. I see all the downloads, and sometimes I wish I could just know who you all were so I can, I can say thank you because you're so amazing. Um... I want to get my, uh, of course, my housekeeping out of the way and first thank my sponsor, Marketing Out the Box Media, um, with Sean Maddox, who has been very instrumental in helping me get my show out there and who has helped me with so much. So, Marketing Out the Box Media with Sean Maddox. You can check him out at Marketing Out the Box, and that is www.marketingoutthebox.com. Okay, so here we are Thursday. I was so surprised at how many people were like tagging me and um, saying they were interested in this specific segment. I mean, all my, my guests are really great. I have the best, um, you know, um, public relations managers that bring me some very instrumental guests for my specific type of show. It's very positive. It's bringing really great resources to people like myself and others like you who are entrepreneurs um, who have, you know, personal concerns or business concerns that you're struggling with, that you need help with, and that is what my show is based about. So, I've never had a segment like this, and, um, and so, so I'm excited about it, um, because there's so much that I want to know also. So, today's guest, um, Dr. Adi Jaffe, and I, I hope I said that right, but what is so, what I'm so excited about this guest is because you know, for those who struggle with any type of addiction, especially alcohol and drug addiction, and they're having their personal struggle, but then you have the family members and the people that they are closest to that are struggling along with them. And it's such a sensitive subject um, that a lot of people try to avoid and just act like sometimes it doesn't exist. He's been very successful. He has an online workshop. He's... Um, helped and has been successful in helping 1,500 plus people within 30 to 60 days of really having a successful program as well as um, 40,000 plus downloads of his workshop. I didn't even know that you could do that. You know, I mean, they, it was in a program like that. And so many of you may not know. You know, he's been seen on Dr. Oz and the Doctors, um, Good Morning America, I mean, and many other platforms. But this is such a great time to have it as in just because People just don't want to talk about it. So let's bring him on the show. Let's start, you know, get some questions. Let's see, you know, we want to know everything about what he can help us and educate us. So let's bring um, Dr. Adi Jaffe onto the platform really quick so we can get started. Hello. Hi. How are you today? Thank you. I'm great. How are you doing? Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm so excited that a lot of people want to hear about this. Well, you know what? I was surprised myself. Because um, it's the most hits actually I've gotten people that have been interested, which says to me, this is a show that people, it's dear to them. So if it's not them struggling with some type of, of addiction, it is maybe family members who struggle along with them. Exactly. So, um, you know, I wanted to start off by asking, why this field? Why this 
field of choice helping others because it's such a sensitive it's such a sensitive subject it is it is so look full transparency i used to struggle myself and um and i i struggled the way a lot of people who know somebody who has an alcohol or drug addiction problem did yeah. and so that meant my social life was um i'll call it less than ideal and i wasn't succeeding i wasn't going after my goals the way I could have otherwise, including school at the time. Mm -hmm. But mine, I mean, for me, it literally landed in, you know, jail time and arrest and all this other kind of stuff. And so when I got out, two things happened. First of all, I literally wasn't able to get hired. I don't know how many people listening right now know somebody in their life who's had a criminal history, but when you have a criminal history, nobody wants to hire you. And mm -hmm. it's not that I don't understand why, it's just the reality I found myself in. So I, for nine months after jail, I couldn't get a job. And so I ended up going back to school. And when I went back to school, the second piece happened, which was I said, okay, let me, let me understand. I don't come from a background where a life of crime and being in jail and things of that nature mm -hmm. were even remotely written near the story, right? They weren't even going to be footnotes, supposedly. And then that's where I ended up. So I wanted to ask the question, what happened? And because school was the only thing I had available to me because I couldn't get a job, mm -hmm. I stuck with school. I ended up getting my master's, actually a second master's as well, and then a PhD in psychology, with the question always being the same. What leads people to addiction? Right? How, can people, how, how do normal, regular people, which I found out is, by the way, everybody who struggles with addiction is a normal, regular person. Right. Um, how do they get there? Which is not what I thought originally, and we'll talk about that maybe a little bit more. But then more importantly, how do we get them out? I got out, and I had a lot of privilege and a lot of other reasons that I got out, but what was it that allowed me to make my way out? And so that's really what I've focused the last 20, 22 years of my life on. And it wasn't entrepreneurial in nature originally, but I think like most entrepreneurs, I was in academia, I got my uh, PhD, and I was in something called postdoc, which is two to three years after you get your PhD, you still work in academia while you're looking to become a professor. And then I started finding gaps in the way we're treating and helping people who struggle with addiction and alcohol. Mm -hmm. And when I identified those gaps, the first thing in my head was somebody needs to go fix this. And when I realized nobody else is going to go fix it, I did what I think every entrepreneur does, which I said, well, I'm going to go do it. And mm -hmm. I've spent the last eight years doing that in different uh, fashion. So we can talk about that later. So, um, I've, I've always been curious, and this is, I mean, maybe because I'm not a person who's ever had a problem with addiction, but I know people who have, because I married somebody once, I'm divorced now. Why do you find that, um, that people, how do I say this, that family members even make it, they, they don't want to admit, or they become a contributor to those to those who have an addiction. And it's, it's hard enough to the ones who are having the issue and, and coming to terms with it, but then you have those closest as if it's happening to them and they don't even want to admit it. Wow, what a good question. Well, first of all, here's the thing. You, when you first knew the person who was struggling, you didn't know them as an individual struggling with addiction. So you developed the concept of who they are as a person. Mm -hmm. And they're good people. People who struggle with addiction are not dumb, they're not useless, mm -hmm. they're not, you know, I'll be PC here, a-holes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. they, they're they really good people who have been struggling, and so we maintain that image of them as life gets worse and worse and worse, because there's this thing called confirmation bias, which is hurting all of us constantly mm -hmm. as we walk through the world, and that is, the world will show you what you believe. You will pay attention to what you already believe, you will find more and more reinforcing evidence towards your current beliefs. And everything that doesn't align with the way you see the world mm -hmm. will almost disappear for you. And I mean, you can see that in our political orientation. Now you can see that around this whole COVID-19 issue. People just hold on to their belief. Mm -hmm. And the same will end up being true about your belief around people. Um, all I need to do to, do to show you that is if you've ever seen somebody who's in a bad relationship where you thought they were in a bad relationship, if you try to explain that to them, it's literally like you're looking at two different human beings. Mm -hmm. So okay. the same exact thing happens around addiction to both the people, the person who's struggling and the people around them who love them and don't want to see them struggling that way. I want to 
to ask a bit about um, addiction being hereditary or in the genetics. So as an example, I've, ne I've never been interested in alcohol or drugs or anything. I don't even like to take pills because I, you know, it's just my paranoia. Seeing TV, they think if you never take anything, as soon as you take it, you become addicted. That's just my paranoia. But um, because I never have, I found that, and I have an ex-husband who, who has, my children never knew him as an alcoholic, a drink, but they drink. And now I find myself um, struggling with them as in, you know, I don't even know where you get that from because I don't drink. You didn't see your dad drunk. Yeah. So in my book, I wrote a book called The Abstinence Myth. And in the book, I talk about four factors that influence mental health in general. But we'll talk about alcohol and drug struggles right now. And that is biology, psychology, environment, and spirituality. So mm -hmm. let's just be frank right off the bat. Obviously, biology plays a role. Mm -hmm. It just plays a bigger role for some people, a smaller role for others, and a medium role for a third set of people. So. It's not that everybody has or doesn't have a biological predisposition. They just have different levels of it. So you can actually have protective biology. And what I mean by that is genetics and um, you know liver enzymes and brain function that protect you and make it less likely you'll struggle with alcohol or drugs. And you can have the opposite. You can have biology, psychology, and, and, and things of that nature that make it harder for you to deal with the world without drugs. So both exist. And they're not an all or nothing black or white sort of question. It's, it's, a, it's a gradient, right? So different people have a different level of struggle around biology. Mm -hmm. That being said, the same is true for psychology, the same is true for environment, and the same is true for spirituality. So you asked a great question, and you asked it in the right way, because a lot of people ask the following question. Is there really such a thing as addictive personality? Or like, you know, is there an addictive gene? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, I don't think either one of those things actually exists. It's just that when we see somebody who gets addicted to things easily, we say, oh, they have an addictive personality. Mm, we give it a label. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, I want to just say this. You know, this is a controversial um, thing maybe sometimes, but I think we get in trouble when we try to label people mm -hmm. based on any single characteristic. Um, race, gender, religion, um, sexual orientation, mm -hmm. mental health issues. When you try to limit a person and say, well, they are a fill in the blank, mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're pretending that you know everything you need to know about them because of that single label. And we've seen what that does, right? Uh, education gaps because of race that have nothing to do with ability and IQ. They just have to do with stigma and, and systemized racism. Um, violence and you know, legal persecution of people of different um, genders or different mm -hmm. um, sexual orientation, those all gen are all engendered by the fact that we think a label means something, but it's not. It's just a word that we decided to use for a group of people. And the same is true for, I don't use the term alcoholics and addicts because <laughs> all those are all those people are, are people who are struggling with alcohol or drugs. How did, how, okay, and I hope this isn't a dumb question, but obviously, in my research, and you know, just it's it now considered a disease because for myself, looking on the outside, you just figure, oh, you know, why can't you just stop? Where, when did the the label disease, ad addiction of alcohol or anything, else become a, a disease? How did that come to fruition? We could probably spend too much time on this, um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll give I'll give you the short answer. Yeah. Um, I don't believe addiction is a disease. Um, mm -hmm. It can look like a disease sometimes. The main reason it moved to disease status is is twofold. First of all, the person who said that was a physician, and so physicians look at everything as disease. Right. That's number one. And the second piece, which I think is the positive piece of it, um, before addiction was seen as a moral failing, like essentially you're a bad person. That's why you're an alcoholic. And mm -hmm. the problem is people weren't getting care, they were just getting punished. Um, look at, you know, 13, the 13th Amendment um, movie and, and documentary, or mm -hmm. people were getting punished for using substances. And um, that's not a good thing either, because that doesn't help anybody, and we know it doesn't help anybody. So mm -hmm. we moved it to disease in order to say, look, it's not their fault that they're struggling with this. They have a medical condition. And and then we use we spent about 50 to 80 years talking about brain science 
as to why people get addicted, which is all true, by the way. The brain is absolutely involved. But again, that's one factor. Biology, psychology, environment, and spirituality matter. And so I think, again, we tried to come up with a simple answer to a really complex question. And so we landed for the last hundred years or so on disease. I call addiction a syndrome. That doesn't mean a lot, the difference between a disease and syndrome to people, so I'll explain it. A syndrome is a set of symptoms that show up together. Mm -hmm. So you're not saying that you know why it happened, but the things just show up together. So cravings, uh, withdrawal, tolerance, um, giving up regular civil, social, environmental, mm -hmm. and family duties, things like that are symptoms, right? Using a drug or alcohol more than you want to, those are all symptoms of addiction. But thinking that you know why something exists mm -hmm. because you see the symptoms is a is a big no no in the medical community. I found that, uh, and, and this, I, I thought was a bit of a contradiction, but, uh, maybe because I don't understand. Is when you treat use a drug, how do you say that? Um, through some type of you use a drug to help to stop using some other form of drug. Yeah, so the, the way I talk about it is this, and maybe this will make it really easy for everybody to understand. Nobody drinks alcohol for alcohol. <laughs> alcohol tastes really bad. Let's just be clear, right? Yeah. Um, let's, not, let's ignore the fact for a second that essentially alcohol is yeast urine, right? Like you're drinking the urine of, an, of, a, of, of yeast essentially to get um, alcohol, and it doesn't taste that good. That's why we mask it. We make mixed drinks, so we, you know, we, we flavor things because it doesn't taste great. But for people who develop problems with alcohol, they had other issues before. Right. And then one day they drank. Mm -hmm. And alcohol seemed to fix those other issues. That happened to me. I was really mm -hmm. socially anxious. I felt awkward around other kids. I had a hard time talking to girls. First time I got drunk at a sleepaway camp, I had a great time. Mm -hmm. I could talk to everybody. I wasn't worried what they were thinking of it. I talked to girls. I even got to fool around with a girl. It was like, it was like somebody just gave me manna from God, you know? And so... Alcohol was not a problem. It was a solution. And it was only years later when alcohol turned to weed, and weed turned to cocaine, and cocaine turned to meth, and I was yeah. using meth all day, mm -hmm. that people talked about me having an alcohol addiction or drug addiction. But they forgot to look at the beginning of why it started. Yeah. And I think right. most people come to me saying, I have an alcohol problem. I say, you don't have an alcohol problem. You have a life problem. You've been fixing it with alcohol for the next tw last 20, 30 years. We've got to go back and fix your life problem. And that's what we do at Ignited. It's what I write about in the book. It's at our core, that's what I mean by, I call my program the hero program because a lot of people, I don't know, you know this, you don't have to share it about your ex-husband. My guess is things happened to him earlier on in life, mm -hmm. inside his head, outside in his life. He didn't know how to deal with them. And then he found alcohol and drugs. And alcohol and drugs made life a lot more tolerable than mm -hmm. life without alcohol and drugs. Mm -hmm. So he used them. Like if you lost a leg, you use a crutch or a wheelchair because it makes life easier. <laughs> it's just the problem is it doesn't cure the underlying issue. And what we need to do is go back in there and cure the underlying issue. Well, when you were just saying about, you know, when you started using alcohol and you just felt better and you were, it just seemed like everything just went away. And um, I also found that, but... Can also it be a depressant for some people? Of course, but like, so look, alcohol is a depressant. Cannabis can be a depressant, but could actually, depending on the strain and depending on your biology, can, can be an up, a mood lifter. Um, opioids kill physical pain, which is why people use them for surgeries, but they also kill emotional pain because what a lot of people don't understand is mm -hmm. your pain centers in the brain process both physical and emotional and psychological pain. That's why people use opiates. They help numb pain. Um, benzodiazepines help you sleep, but they also reduce anxiety. So every drug has effects, every drug that gets abused has effects that people like. And they like them not just for celebration. I've rarely run into somebody who developed a drug or alcohol problem because they use substances only to celebrate. A lot of times, that happens sometimes, mm -hmm. but then there's specific conditions. But if people are using drugs or alcohol to deal with, mask, circumvent, take shortcuts, et cetera, around their psychological and mental well-being, mm -hmm. I think that's when we get into trouble. 
So to get a little into your program, so, you know, the only program that I've ever really even been familiar with that I know of is, you know, you, you, of course, you have a lot of the, where you, what do you call it, those in-house, I guess, program. And people that you see often are so, right, are so unsuccessful, not successful. It takes three, four, five times. And I, I don't understand why that is. How did your program come into fruition that made mm -hmm. that different and changed it? So when I was a postdoc, I studied why don't people get help and why don't they get better, exactly what you were just asking. So a lot of people don't know this, but 90% of people who need help for addiction don't even go get it. 90%. That's not the same as any other medical condition, by the way. For cancer, if you're told that you have a cancer issue, 80% of people go get help. In addiction, it's 10%. Diabetes, if you're told you have diabetes, about 70% of people get help. Even for depression anxiety and things like that. It's like 50 or 60% of people who are told they have depression, try treatment, medication, therapy, something. In addiction, it's 10%. So I was looking at why, and the four barriers, the four things that I found to keep people is cost, is one of them, it's massive. Um, an average cost of rehab, the, the way you talked about it, is $10,000. Wow. Now, wow. your life has to get pretty bad for you to be willing to spend $10,000 yeah. to make it better. Yeah. Right. I mean, I don't know how many vacations ten thousand dollars is for most people, but it's a yeah. lot. I don't know how many really nice date nights and dinners ten thousand dollars is, but it's a lot. So yeah. we don't do it. And obviously, we know. I live in LA. We know about the Malibu rehabs that are right. fifty, sixty, seventy, a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> per month. Right. Right. Per month. Right. It's like a BMW every month. Just here you go. So that's one main reason people don't go. The other part is that it's a logistical nightmare. Imagine how bad your life has to be for you to decide that you're going to take 30, 60, or 90 days off of life mm -hmm. to go be in that place where you're going to spend $50,000 to make your life better. Unless you're a multimillionaire, life has to get really, really bad because you have a job, mm -hmm. you have a family, you have right. friends, you have mortgage, rent, anything, pets, whatever it is you have, you have responsibilities. Who can take 30 or 60 days off of life? Right. The only way you can take that much time off of life is if your life is done, if there's nothing going on for you. Which is why most people who go to quote unquote rehab hit rock bottom, right? That's what we always hear about. Right. We've, we've been thinking that it's because people with addiction don't want to get help until they hit rock bottom, but that's BS. Mm -hmm. It's just that going away to a rehab that costs $50,000 for 30 days, my life has to get really terrible for me to look for $50,000. <laughs> take 30 days off life. Right. So one of the things we do in our program is it's really affordable, like from a dollar ninety two dollars a day to the high end is something like nine bucks a day. Mm -hmm. Like that's what we do. And the reason we do it is we want to make it really, really affordable for people. Then come the other reasons why people don't get help. First one is shame. You talked yeah. about your ex-husband, so you know this one well. Yeah. Nobody who has addiction wants to walk up to anybody else and say, hey, I'm really struggling right now. Yeah. yeah. We live in a country and we live in a society where not doing well is not something you advertise. You always smile and you tell everybody that you're doing great no matter what's going on behind closed doors. And most of us know that from our families, right? We could be having the biggest family fight at home. And then when you walk out, come on, put a smile on your face. Yeah, right. Oh my God, how are you doing? And oh, it's so good. I'll see you at the barbecue next weekend. So we live in that world. And so when you really struggle with drugs or alcohol, you don't tell anybody about it of mm -hmm. shame and stigma. Now, think about rehab or even AA meetings. What are you saying to people? You're saying to somebody who feels like they're doing really, really well and they don't want to talk to anybody about it. Hey, how about you spend a lot of money, take 30 days, and go spend it with a lot of people you don't know and tell them all your problems? Right. Or why don't you walk to an AA meeting, full, a room full of people you've never met before, and just confess to them your issues? Who wants to do that? Nobody wants to. So again, the only people who do it are the people who have no options. Finally, and this is a big one, it's again why I wrote this book called The Abstinence Myth. Essentially every form of treatment, every rehab, every therapist, everybody who treats addiction, almost, like in the 90% and up, mm -hmm. tells you that if you struggle with drugs and alcohol, you have to be willing to quit. You have to be ready to stop. I'm sure that's what your ex-husband was told many, many times. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the problem. Just think about this for a second. If I lost a leg and I have a crutch, you're gonna tell me I can't use my crutch? Oh, yeah, good luck then, right. No, I need my crutch. I can't live without my crutch. 
So we've set up a system where for somebody to get help with a problem, they have to get rid of the problem before they get a solution. Imagine, I don't know if you've ever went to a therapist or anything, but you know people who've gone to therapists. Imagine you're struggling with anxiety and you go to see a therapist and they say, hey, I'm really, really excited about helping you with the anxiety. Thank you so much for being willing to spend the money and come and tell me you struggle with anxiety. That's really big. Here's, I just need you to understand, if we're going to work on this, I need you to not have anxiety anymore. So, I can't work with you if you're going to keep having anxiety. You said you want to not have anxiety and you're serious about it, so no more anxiety, okay? If you, if you have anxiety, I can't see you. It sounds crazy when I say it, because I'm coming to the therapist for help with anxiety. Yeah. So a therapist says, oh, you're having anxiety, let's work on it. But in addiction treatment, you, if you drink, if you smoke, if you use a drug, what do they do? They kick you out of treatment. <laughs> because you're and not that's allowed what you're there to for. do the thing. You're not allowed to do the thing you came to get help with. Yeah. It's insane. It makes no sense. And we've been running that way for a hundred years. So at Igniting, we tell people right off the bat, do what you can. If you want to reduce, if you want to quit, do whatever you can right now, but keep coming. Mm -hmm. Keep talking to us. Keep working through the problem because we're going to help make your leg stronger. And when your leg is strong enough, you can get rid of the crutch. So at Ignited, people are spending, you know, between a dollar fifty and dollar ninety for like nine bucks a day instead of ten thousand dollars a month. Um, they can do it whenever they want to, literally on their phone. So people people get help with us during their lunch hour on uh, from work, before they go into work, after dinner, on the weekend, whenever they can do it. Um, they also show up because a lot of our help is uh, being able to gets done without talking to anybody. They can right. do it without telling anybody that they're struggling, which is what mm -hmm. they want anyway. Right. And even if they do go to groups, like let's say they do Zoom groups, they can just turn their camera and their microphone off and they can be there getting help oh, wow. without being seen. And last but not least, they don't have to tell us that they're ready to quit in the beginning. Mm -hmm. They can come in as they are and get the help. So we've We've had over 2,000 people enroll today. We've helped people, you mentioned this in the beginning, but we've helped people cut back their drinking by 50, 60, as much as 90% within two months of joining us. People who've been to treatment many times, people who've been trying to get help for 20, 30 years, because we completely changed the way they look at the problem, and we stop focusing on the symptom, on the drinking, and we start fixing what's going on for them inside. Do you think that that's really the, because of the, the mental part, when people finally get their awakening of, um, uh, I, I guess the best way to I example is, I was in and out of therapy for almost 13 years, nothing having to do with like drugs or alcohol, but sure. it was other things that I was having issues with until it finally, I had to come to terms with essentially it was me and things I was doing. And then once I, I dealt with myself, which is the hardest thing to do, you know, I would end up having like a breakdown and all this other stuff because it, your, your source is you. Um, is that is when it was like the light went on and I made, I, I was able to make the change and packed up and moved away. Um, mm. So do you think usually when a person, when they come to the terms with that, that mental um, adjustment, what, uh, what happened, maybe they, it was trauma or abuse or something. And that, right. that's usually what starts the... Um, the recovery? Yeah, so, look, the short answer is yes, but I'm going to give you a, a slightly expanded answer. We have three principles, exploration, acceptance, transformation. Mm -hmm. I, I always kind of joke, you have to eat to grow, right? So, exploration, acceptance, transformation. Exploration is find out how you got here. Because you said it's all about you, and it is all about you, but who are you and what happened to you, mm -hmm. right? Um, you and I grew up in very different settings, in different 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 places with different cultures. We had different experiences, mm -hmm. so we're not bringing the same thing to this moment. Right. You have to understand what brought you to this place. It could be trauma. It could be biological dysfunction. It could be a million different things. So you do that first. Then, especially with us, a lot of people when they find out what happened and what's quote unquote wrong, they want to run and fix it right away. There's a problem, and that problem is shame. When you find out what's quote unquote wrong with you, is why I put in air quotes, and go try to fix it, what you're saying to yourself and the rest of the world is, I don't like those parts of myself, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna ignore them. I'm gonna move forward and, and get to the other side as fast as possible. Uh, 
that this might be a newsflash to a lot of people. You can't ignore yourself. You're here. You're here forever. And, um, you know, Rose, if you had trauma in your past, we can't erase it. Right. You had it. Mm -hmm. And trying to run away from it is never going to make you better. So you have to get into acceptance. So explore and then accept. Once you've gotten into full acceptance, what do I mean by acceptance? There's nothing broken with you. You're not a terrible human being. Um, you're not damaged. You're not sick. You've been through a lot of experiences that have, have molded, that created the you that we're seeing here right now. You land there and you, you accept, okay, I've done my best to now, but now I want to do differently. I want to do more. I want to do better. I'm not running away from my old self. I'm taking my old self, all the wounds, everything, and I'm going to mold them into something else. Now comes transformation. Because you're not running away from yourself anymore. right? Running away from yourself is drugs, is anxiety, is alcohol, right. is depression. Right. Is, all that stuff is running away from yourself. Bad relationships. Then you say, oh, okay, I see myself as I am, but I want to go there. And now you start finding the tools, the, the paths, the journeys, the goals that will get you where you want to go. The models, right? What are the role models that are going to get you there? So that's how we work at Ignited. We don't run away from ourselves ever, because that's useless. You're, I mean, it's not, I'm literally, I can't run away from myself, right? I'm in my own body. I'm going to be here forever right. until I'm not here anymore. So, um, yeah, so that's the model that we employ with people. And we help them, essentially, I hate the idea that people don't change. I think it's, again, BS. People change a lot, all the time. We help them choose the direction in which they want to change, and we help them get there. So when you wrote the, the book, if you can share some, and, and is it, I mean, is it any bit of a biography and some of your, of, of your sharing, your experiences, and how you're able to help others in your book and outlining? Uh, yeah, I shared the first chapter has a little bit of my history in it, because I think that's useful. It's how I got here. Um, but look, the reality is nobody, nobody put it together for me. I started, I went to regular rehab, I went to AA for three years, then I went to school, and I saw that what psychologists think about addiction and what AA thinks about addiction are like two completely different universes. Mm -hmm. And then I started putting it together, and then I left AA, and I started putting together my own life plan. And, and I learned a lot along the way, and so what I put down were principles that I saw as ways to run your life. Uh, and in reality, it has nothing to do with addiction. Again, it has to do with making you the best version of yourself at all times. So I can tell from just talking to you for a little bit, this isn't going to be news for you, but we're always improving. Mm -hmm. We're always making ourselves better. That doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. It's a lie that you get to some place, my, my belief, is that it's a lie that you get to some place and you say, oh, I'm done now. I've become the best version of myself. We're always working, we're always refining, we're always learning. And so what I, you know, what I wrote in the book more than anything else is for people who struggle with drugs and alcohol, a path, and for their loved ones, a lot of people who buy the book are their loved ones, and people who struggle. Um, a way to understand what's happening, so you're not scared of it anymore, and then find an actual roadmap on how to get out. And that's what we do with the online program as well. Can you explain a bit about the online program and you know, how yeah. people are, how they can connect and, you know, um, you know, are there different, um, I guess, phases of it? Great question. So, um, yeah, the general idea of the program, which we call the United Hero Program, mm -hmm. is to help people start from a place where they can understand that there's a different life for them. We made it super easy. So not only is it cheap, but you can sign up at 2 o'clock in the morning and start getting help when nobody else is up and everybody else is asleep because right now is when you decided you want help. That's a really important thing, right? You, we all need to be involved and, and bought in and motivated to be better. That's a very, very important part of the puzzle. So you sign up and you get taken to an assessment because, look, not everybody's the same. So if mm -hmm. I'm going to help you, I need to know who you are. Mm -hmm. So you answer a bunch, a bunch of questions. And then the system learns things about you. Like, for instance, let's say, I'm just making this up for you, Rose. Let's say you go on the platform, and the main things you're struggling with are romantic relationships and fun and recreation. You forgot. You haven't had fun in 15 years. You forgot what it's about. The program then starts tailoring itself to help you in the areas you struggle most and help you learn 
what does it take to be good in relationships? Uh, how can you bring in more fun and recreation into your life? Or if it's career, or um, or your, your mental health, or your physical health, all those things. And then we check in with you every single day. Every day when you come back to the platform, we check in. How are you feeling today? What are you struggling with the most? Did you drink? Did you not drink yesterday? And the system is constantly adapting to your needs. So that's happening fully automated. You never have to talk to one human being to make that happen. You're watching videos, videos of me explaining things to you and doing lessons. You're, you're doing worksheets and filling things out of yourself. Hmm. All of that can happen without talking to a human being. Wow. Then, then a lot of us find them, once we get our feet out under us, mm-hmm. we do want to talk to some people. So we have groups every day, 20 groups a week, where you get to come, come check in. And there's coaches that I've trained and amazing coaches in our platform. I, I lead four of the groups myself still to this day. And you get to come in and have a real live conversation. If you're not ready to have a conversation yet, you turn your camera off. You keep your uh, your mic off and you listen, but you're in a room full of people who are like-minded. And and then you connect with some of those people. So we have a community where you can talk to those people and email and mm-hmm. chat with them mm-hmm. and send messages. And so what we've seen happens to a lot of people is it kind of goes like this. They come in mm-hmm. and they're completely lost and hopeless. They don't know what to do. And then they get a little bit of hope because they see what is possible and they, they meet some other people and they move from uh, what I call, like, essentially hopeless, what I call seeker. We have something called the hero code. And in the seeker level, you start believing that there's a better path for you, and you're just searching for what that is. And that's how we take, we were just on a call yesterday for one of, uh, one of the things we're doing on the platform right now. And, you know, this woman who has been to multiple treatment centers and multiple rehabs and been struggling with alcohol for 30 years, wow. said that in the first five to six days with us, she started making realizations that nobody had ever told her, nobody had ever mentioned could have anything to do with this, but the moment that it hit, the moment she understood how past abusive relationships and the way her dad treated her and things that happened very early on in life created this reality that she's been working with for the last you know, 30, 40 years of her life, struggling. You could see the relief in her. Now, nothing changed about her drinking yet, but you could see the relief she had in saying, oh my God, there's another way to look at this. And this is a woman who's been trying to do this for 20, 30 years. So what we do know for sure we do by now for people is we help them finally understand that alcohol is not their problem, mm-hmm. that there are far deeper issues they need to, to, to fix. And then we help them start digging through them. So we help one of my most successful cases had been to rehab, I don't even know how many times, but had been struggling with this for literally 20, 30 years, getting to really, really heavy drugs. Lost her family, lost her kids in the process, got involved in criminal justice so that she was, like, she lost her social security number. It was insane. Not only did she quit drugs, she got her daughter's back. Uh, she joined us about three years ago. This year, she gave her daughter in a, in a wedding, so her daughter not only allowed her back into her life, but had her so connected that she was in her wedding just literally a few months ago and she's now training to be a coach as she just got training to be a coach within our program what people can do with their lives when they fix this issue is intense because you and you probably know this even just from talking about your ex-husband there were really good aspects to your ex-husband oh yeah Yeah. but when alcohol and drugs got in the way (laughs) it's like those disappeared right because he wasn't being able to be the best version of himself. And that's what we try to do. We help people find that. How important do you think, uh, people say that, you know, you have to have that mentorship. You have to have somebody else with you. Because some many people think, I can do it alone. Because it could be the embarrassment and the shame. But then, I mean, can you do it alone? I think you can start it alone. I think it's really, really hard to finish it alone. Um, and the reason is this. I don't mean to keep harping on you and your ex, but it's, uh, I know that that's one of the perspectives you have for it. Yeah. <laughs> people, people who struggle a lot with drugs and alcohol, their worlds become really small. Yeah. They lose relationships. They lose jobs. They lose family members. People disconnect from them. So they end up having a very, very small reality. Mm-hmm. But we're social animals. We crave connection. And so mm-hmm. once you get a little bit stronger and you can kind of stand on your own two feet, I think you really need to put your arms around some people and, and get back in the community. Yeah. 
Right. So for instance, in the Ignited program, module one through about seven or eight, so about half the program you can do completely on your own. Because I know people want to be able to feel stronger before they take it out into the community. Right, right. But within a few months, it's time to start bringing some other people in. Now we help people do that because we have you know hundreds of members and our groups have dozens of people in them. So you can come in and not have to be alone, but be slightly connected. And then you learn connection. And then all of a sudden you start making friends. And now you can take those friends from the United groups to your real life. And eventually you get to take them to your old friends and your family and everything. You know, do you think that um, TV, magazines, um, a lot of these shows play a big part in how they um, advertise alcohol? You know, for me, mm -hmm. I see a lot of, it just seems like everybody's got some alcohol in their hand and it's glamorous. Um, and or, you know, some commercials take a pill and you'll feel better. Yep. And it makes it so much more difficult. Do you, do you, are you... In, in your program, is that something that, you know, that you guys look at and think, how, you know, when they when they're done, what are they going to do when they're when they're off the program? What are they going to see? How are they going to react? Such a great question. So again, I just want to remind everybody, our program doesn't make you have to quit later. Right. So some people come to us and they do want to be able to drink, just not drink a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but more importantly, to your question, is the following. Look. All of marketing in the universe sells you things based on the idea that what you have isn't enough, but if you just bought their product, your life would be better, right? Right. That's how all marketing works. Hey, do you feel down sometimes? Well, yeah, of course. Everybody feels down sometimes. <laughs> hey, do you go to sleep and sometimes have other thoughts and don't fall asleep right away? Take our new pill. Um, what I tell my people all the time is, look, if you can't fall asleep when you want to fall asleep, why? Ask the question, why am I not falling asleep? Are you watching TV too late? Did I eat too late? Am I having too much sugar? Is your work life or your relationship so stressful that you're staying up at night thinking about it? If the answer to any of those things is yes, don't take a pill to fix it. Because the pill doesn't fix any of the things I just talked about. Right. So now your relationship still sucks, your, your work is terrible, you're still eating badly, you're still watching TV until the last second, you just have a pill that helps you fall asleep, which means all those things are gonna catch up with you more. So the answer to your question is, like I said, our users, the people who come to Ignite It, end up with a life they like. So they're not trying to run away from it. Right. And because they're not trying to run away from it, they don't need short fixes to make it better. So if you're having a toast of champagne at a wedding to celebrate somebody, that's very different than having half a bottle of champagne so you can talk to somebody at that wedding. Mm. So going back to your program and being incarcerated, and so incarceration is supposed to, it, it's supposed to be your time of um, rediscovery. And, you know, I, I know people who've been incarcerated, and they say these programs, they're really not, program they're really not helping you just going dry basically and they give you something you know to to appease you so you're not an ass you know and try to calm you down yeah, I guess right. basically but um is this something that you have have you ever considered to where it can be useful in institutions a program like this being that it can be online and giving them access I love that you're bringing that up that is <laughs> literally one of the avenues that we're trying to work on is to bring this to the Department of Corrections, mm -hmm. um, 100%. And the, the reason that I think it would work incredibly well is, like it or not, people who are stuck in jails and prisons don't have access to a lot of drugs. Right. So this is actually a really, really good time to work on those things that are harder to work on when you're out in the real world and you stop working and you and your homies just get together and everybody pulls out a 40 or pulls out right. a drink or just... You know, whatever, the glass of wine with dinner or whatever you're doing, right? Your five o'clock whiskey, whatever it is that you do, um, you go out into regular everyday society and people are giving you stuff all the time. Alcohol, mm -hmm. cigarettes, vapes, weed, you know, whatever. Right. In jail, that happens a lot less. So it's actually technically a really, really good time to do it. But if we're honest, look, half, more than half the people in my industry don't even understand addiction. So how can we expect a sheriff or a police officer mm -hmm. to have any idea what to do with somebody who's struggling with addiction. They don't, and they shouldn't. That's not their job. 
Which I think the in, in an institution, even starting at a young age, um, for juvenile institution, is um, I don't see they really, like you say, help with the, the mental pro problem. And then you parole or or right back into the same neighborhood with the same people rather than fooling you. I never understood that process and how it's almost like it's against you. You're, you're put, they're putting you back to where you came from, where it all started, in, in a sense. Yeah, it's not almost like it's against you. It is against you. Um, and by the way, I'll just say this in case there's anybody listening right now for whom this is relevant. If there's anybody listening right now, we're working on this from multiple angles, but who uh, has a way to get into a criminal justice institution and wants to help us get into prisons and jails, please get in touch because that is something I'm actively working on and trying to do a better and better job of. But, um, you know, when it comes to kids and teenagers, one of the things I know, we all know this, but teens and kids care about one thing more than anything else, and that is their friends. Yeah. They care about the social mm -hmm. network that they're part of. So I think that in order to beat that long term, we have to create um, cultures and societies and kid groups that can model what is it like to still be cool, still be good, still be productive, and still mm -hmm. be um, fun, because kids are not adults, and we shouldn't treat them like mm -hmm. adults. How do we give them something to aspire to from a group of other kids who are, are responsible. And that's, I'll be perfectly honest, honest, that is not somewhere where I specialize. I think that takes very, very special people with very, very special skills mm -hmm. to be able to do a good job of that. I, mean, I work with young adults and up. And how does, how do most people, uh, how do you know what, what to look out for, for a person when you think they might need help? So of course, you know, I was, you know, and just not from, um, my ex with people who who drank and I was like oh you know only when they drink they get a, a little like, you know happy but you, you don't think that they're um, it's a problem what are signs that help you know that you know this person could possibly be having a problem and then what would be the next step that you would recommend I, I, I'm sure it's our approach it's all in the approach it is in the approach um, I think look the first answer is simple it's just not necessarily that very easy to follow uh, and that is look for any massive change in the behavior and that's that could be sleep patterns friends they're hanging out with um, habits all of a sudden they're doing things completely differently a lot of times for somebody to completely change any one of those three things something big just changed in life and it could be drugs or alcohol that's one piece but the second piece that you talked about, a lot of people bring up to me all the time, clients also bring up to me all the time, that is, you know, hey, I can only have fun if I drink. You know, I'm only, I'll never have fun if I stop drinking. And then that, the point I make to them is, look, let's be clear, right? This is not fun. There's nothing fun about this. Um, the drink I made might be tasty, but I'm, that's not fun. And then I go, okay, well, what is fun for you when you drink then? Explain the fun part for me. And what people then start describing are really the things they want to be able to do without alcohol. Like, I want to be able to talk to people freely at a party and not worry and not be anxious. Right. I want to be able to sing and dance with my friends in public when we go out to a club, but I can't. I feel really awkward. Uh, I want to be able to talk to a girl. I want to be able to talk to a guy. I want to be able to talk to a fill in the blank. But I get really nervous, so if I have three or four drinks before, I can really enjoy myself. Each one of those problems I, I named are uh, public performance anxiety, right? Uh, anxiety with people that you're attracted to and social anxiety in that, that kind of setting when, when there's a lot at stake because I like someone, I want them to like me back. Um, and those are the things that I need to fix. Alcohol is not helping you with any of those things. It's just actually making you think that you need alcohol for that. Um, literally with one of the people the other day, I was, it was half a joke, but it wasn't really. She's struggling with one of these things, which is pretty common. And I said, well, this week I want you to find at least one group of people that you kind of know but don't know really, really well and set up an opportunity to speak in front of them or give a lecture or in some other way kind of be the focus of attention for at least one event. Because if you really struggle talking in front of people you don't know and feeling comfortable, we need to practice sitting and talking in front of people that you don't <laughs> really know you comfortable. Right. Having a drink is not going to help that ever. So I, I know we're close to the end of the show, but I, I definitely want to make sure that um, you gave so much, so much for me, actually, um, so much that was resourceful and insightful. And, but I want to make sure for those who are listening that they know how to find your program or connect. Um, 
And so for anybody who, if, if you are listening, you can always jump on the live, go to the website, entrepreneurlifeshow.com. You can watch the full interview as well as how to connect. It's on the webpage. It will be there all the time. It will be there on the YouTube channel. So that if you know somebody or maybe you've lost something um, and you missed part of the show on the replay, just check it out, listen, or watch live. So if you don't mind sharing that um, before we close the show. Okay. Got it. Um, I hope other people join us. Sorry, I was trying to talk to my assistant about getting you guys something special who's watching you today. Because not only do I love questions and talking to people, <laughs> I also know that just like we talked about up until this moment, a lot of people who struggle, they want to be able to find it. So the first place to find us is ignited.com. And that is spelled like here, I-G-N-T-D. Oh, you can't really see it, I-G-N-T-D. And we will make sure we put that on the website too. So ignited.com is, uh, is one of the easiest places to find us. But I think we're going to try to see if we can even work on getting your people a special link to get a discount so they can oh. get it for even cheaper, uh, which we never actually offer. So uh, that could be really, really cool to help people who really want to get help. Because again, right, we have people who will answer the phone and we have all this stuff, but a lot of us don't really want to talk to anybody. We just want to go fix it. Yes. So, <laughs> So ignited.com, which I'll put in our chat so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. Ignited.com is the easiest place to find out about it. It'll tell you everything we're doing. Just so it's clear, we're going to try to get you a discount here in a minute. Either way, you can get a 14-day free trial. So anybody right now who wants to go to ignited.com, right on top, it'll tell you join our 14-day free trial. And you can try out what we're doing for a couple of weeks. All in. Try anything you want. And, um, and that will give you a lot of help. So. Well, make sure that everybody that you, if you make sure you either go to the website and we will have it on the website or on the YouTube channel. Um, so you can get all of the information. And so that way for those, I, I why I believe this is such a sensitive subject is when I initially started, um, my, I'm an introvert, believe it or not, started my podcast. It was, I didn't do any of the live. And it was just on accounting, and I was like, oh, you know, it was one of the, the steps that I have to do to talk to people. And like you said, they can't see me. So I was just doing the verbal thing. And, um, and it was just about accounting. I, I, I do accounting for a living. That's actually my business. And so, um, but then people were, they don't want to talk about money. You don't want to talk about religion. You don't want to talk about illness. And so, and this was a very, another very sensitive subject. But I found that when I talked and I explained anything about accounting, People were like downloading and listening. I'm like, what? So people don't want to share that they're having money problems or they don't want to share political view. They don't want to share religious view. They'll listen though and take what they want and even maybe chime in without them knowing who you are. And so um, as I found that people were interested, I thought, oh, I'm going to start. And, and, and now you see me going live. And so I think with this, it's the same thing. You don't want to say that you have a problem but you want to say it but you don't want people to know it's, it's you but you want help <laughs> you know I mean? look i'm also an introvert i'm actually kind of right on the border i i taught at ucla for almost a decade and in front of three four hundred people so i can do that and i can i've given ted talks in front of whatever fifteen hundred two thousand people but i also used to get very incredibly nervous and practice Practice, practice changes everything in your life. And this is why I hate so much, and maybe this is a good kind of lead me for people. It's BS that people don't change. Let me just repeat that. I know I said it earlier. It's, it's, it's completely false. You are changing all the time. Every week, every month, every year, every decade, you're becoming a different person. The question you have to start asking yourself is this. Am I going to care enough about where I end up five years, 10 years, 20, 30, 50 years from now to stop letting the world determine what I'm going to change into and start taking control over it and start saying, okay, I, I know I'm going to change. 10 years from now, I'm going to be different. What do I want to become? And then put the steps in place to become that person. And I promise you, I'm talking to the next meth addict who's been, who spent a year in prison um, with 13 felony counts, mm -hmm. right? Like, I'm, this might look easy and I might be a professor now and all that stuff. That's not, that's not where I came from. So right. you can change anything about your life. It's just, you have to take the time, you have to put the effort and you have to know how to do it. So you have to talk to people who've done it or who, who right. know how to do it to get the steps because 
the only reason you're not that person right now is you either haven't done the work or you don't know how to do it. So figure that out and you'll need help on the front end because you'll need other people who've been there before. And you know that from accounting, you may be an amazing accountant, Rose, but you didn't like wake up one day and go, I want to be an accountant. And then boom, you became an accountant. That's not how it works. You had school, you had classes, you had to learn about debits and credits and you had to learn about different accounts. And, and I'm still learning learn. every day. <laughs> So the right. same exact thing, thing is true with depression, it's true with anxiety, and it's true with alcohol and drug issues. Okay, listeners, so I hope you guys got a lot out of this, because I definitely got a lot out of it. And I want to make sure that you guys, if you are watching live, download the app. I really just say go to the website. Go to the website, entrepreneurlifeshow.com. Watch the live interview. It will always be there on the replay. Um... I hope that everybody enjoyed my guest on the show and that you will come next time, next Thursday, see who I have on the show next Thursday. Um, we will see you then. And thank you again, um, Dr. Adi Joffe. And we will see everybody next week. Thanks for listening and tuning in. Bye, everybody. Until next time.